Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them. And we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week... Undone by Blood number two, or The Shadow of a Wanted Man. I really was very impressed with issue number one. Issue number two was even better. And when issue number two was better than a solid issue number one, that's something that stands out to me. Undone by Blood is a great modern western tale of revenge. I really like this one. You get more into the character and into the depth of the story and the thematic material in issue number two. This is written by Lonnie Nadler and Zach Thompson. It's got artwork by Sammy Cavella. Sammy Cavella's artwork is absolutely amazing in this. Great composition and layouts, really striking images, very simplistic line work at times, but it's very um, steeped in, in fine and refined detail. Jason Wordy's colors add that grit and texture that really makes this feel like a classic Western story, even though it's a more modern day Western. And of course, Hassan Otsman El Hal, just a fantastic letterer, and he's going above and beyond in the pages of Undone by Blood. This book is great. There's another story in here, because in the story, the main character, she's reading this old Western novel. So in the Western novel is The Shadow of a Wanted Man, and you're getting a more classic, um, typical, um, old school type Western. To have both stories, they tie in together. Um, they have relevant thematic material that ties in back and forth. I absolutely love this. I loved issue number one, and I thought issue number two was even better. There are a lot of comic books out this week, and a lot of strong comic books, especially on the indie front. For me, Undone, Blood, uh, Undone by Blood, number two. Pick of the week. Loved it. That's from Aftershock Comics. Also from Aftershock, we have Artemis and the Assassin. This is a new one by Stephanie Phillips, Megan Hedrick, Francesca Fantini. Um, this was a pretty decent book. It's not quite clear what exactly is going on. You basically got some kind of something going on. They're in Russia. Yeah, so you got like time assassins. These are assassins that go through time and they're like killing like important figures in the past, like maybe like you know, Russian czars or something like that. Um, and then it gets tied into um, another character, and now they're kind of in this cat and mouse game. We don't really know what's going on. It was an okay book. It was not quite clear. It didn't really have a good hook. It was a cool concept, but it never really did anything to just completely hook me in. There's a lot of stuff out this week. Undone by Blood was amazing. Artemis and the Assassin was, it was solid. It wasn't a bad comic book, but... I don't know if it's going to be memorable on the big stack that I read this week. Let's go over to Boom Studios. They got some awesome comics out today. First of all, a debut from Wicked Things. This was a comic book I actually had the pleasure of reading about a month ago and kind of forgot about it, but I reread it tonight and I was like, oh yeah, I read this. John Allison, Max Saren and company. This is basically like, so it's a story of a Nancy Drew type character. She's a like, a, like an amateur uh, detective, right? And there's this convention that she gets uh, invited to go to where a bunch of different uh, professional detectives and amateur detectives all come together and she kind of gets framed for a murder and it becomes a big whodunit and a neat mystery. It's a cool book. It was actually really fun, had great dialogue and interesting characters um, and the hook at the end was really, really grasping. Really did like it, thought it was cool. Um, Wicked Things number one from Boombox, also from Boom This Week. Something is Killing the Children returns with issue number six, kicking off the second story arc. Definitely worth the wait. This book was awesome. I'm loving it. James Tiny and the Fourth, Werther del Editera, uh, Miguel Muerto, they have just taken this book, and initially I think it was just supposed to be those five issues, and then because of the success, they were able to expand it out, and I'm sure that James and company had plans to do that, because you can tell that it's clear that they had plans to do that. Taking the story into the next level, this book has been great. It's been a great horror comic book that holds no punches back. It will really hit you hard. It's tragic, it's sad, it's brutal, it's honest, and it's exciting, and it's a great comic book. The artwork's got really great double page spreads, the flow of it. It works with Tiny and Scripps so well. It makes it one of the, usually with Tiny and Scripps, he's a little bit wordy. He's a little bit of a verbose writer, right? Um, 
But the way that Della Edadera, if that's how you say their name, um, the way that the artwork uh, kind of lays out the page, it really breaks it up into some nice panels and it keeps that flow, it keeps that momentum going, it works in conjunction with that script, with those words, to just make it go right through. This is a very fast read, but it's always a great read, it'll always hit you with surprises, and you start learning some things about some of the mysteries involved in the pages of issue number six, well worth the wait. I love this book. It continues that momentum of being just so strong. <laughs> Boom's been killing it. Here's Red Mother. Red Mother number four is out this week from Boom Studios. Jeremy Hahn, Dar uh, Danny Luckert. This book has been blowing me away. It's a little bit of a slow burn. You got slow uh, unveiling of mysteries. You got a little bit of revelations here and more questions posed there and really shocking and creepy and scary moments. This book has been built on that since issue number one. It continues that into issue number four. A fantastic book. Nice, clean, concise line work that really helps propel the story through <clears throat> and makes it something that's enticing, even though it's a brisk read. And at times it may seem like not a lot happens per issue. A lot does happen per issue. It's a great character study about someone dealing with, with a tragedy and kind of trying to get through that. Um, and then you got all this Red Mother creepy stuff and it's that's all just a slow burn but this is truly horrific and it's amazing and I'm loving it so much. Red Mother number four does not disappoint. Also from Boom, we have Alienated number two. I really did like issue number one and issue two was actually even better. You get more into the depth of what's actually going on. You got these three kids, they find this alien artifact in the woods. Now all of a sudden they're connected telepathically to each other. Um, the lettering does a great job of letting you know who's talking to who, they're sharing headspace. This lets you see a little bit of the struggle that that does involve, a little bit of the empathy that they start feeling once they start actually understanding each other. A lot of mystery from the first one kind of gets solved, but a lot more starts building up. Great momentum, great artwork. It's got a nice fluid dynamic style to it. The coloring is top notch. Notch. This is Simon Spurrier, Chris Wild Goose, and Andre May. I loved it. Issue number two, a little bit better than issue number one. This is a solid debut, yet another from Boom Studios. Finally from Boom, let's talk about Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number four, the penultimate issue. So in this one, the Power Rangers become Ninja Rangers and the Turtles become Power Turtles. And it's so much fun. It's so exciting. The artwork is kinetic. It's highly charged. The story is great. The characters work. The scenes work. It's enthralling for fans of TMNT or Power Rangers. You're definitely going to be pleased. This book doesn't let up. You get to see some interesting familiar faces and some new and interesting familiar roles, but really cool stuff. I'm really liking it. Power Rangers, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh yeah, and Shredder's got the dragon coin. <laughs> Yeah, that's going to end well. So we got the debut of AWA. That's Upshot, right? AWA has debuted. Got a slew of number one books. Let's talk about them. First of all, The Resistance, number one. This one's by J. Michael Straczynski, Mike Diodato Jr., and Frank Martin. This was really good. It was kind of scary because this is about a pandemic that hits the globe, and it hits it really, really hard. And some of the survivors, they wanted becoming superheroes, right? Straczynski and Diodato do a great job of building up this sense of dread. Now, current events in the world may probably have helped that along, to be honest with you. Um, but it actually kind of unraveled the story very fun. And when it got to, and very scarily, when it got to the end, though, you're like, oh, okay, so some of the survivors get superpowers. Okay, so at the end, you really get the idea that, oh, this is like Rising Stars. This is JMS trying to do Rising Stars again. Hmm. We shall see where it goes. The cool thing is this is only planned to be six issues, but at least that's going to be the first initial arc if it's successful. I will tell you this, though. The book is scary. The way this pandemic unfolds, it, it it's unstoppable. It comes out there, and it's it was very effective. I really liked this one. I thought it was pretty solid. The Resistance, number one. <clears throat> one of the more solid debuts from JMS that I've read in several years, but it does start giving you slight Rising Star vibes at the end there. I don't know how I feel about that one. We got Hotel, number one, or Hotel Hell, or just hell. I think it's hotel. Hotel hell? Maybe? I don't know. But it's hotel. Um, this is by John Lees. John Lees is the writer of Mountainhead. He's the writer of Sync. He does really great work with really cool psychological horror at time and just in-your-face horror as well. This is a horror kind of book. It's set in this, this hotel that's got four rooms in it, and each room is going to have its own story. This is a four-issue series, so I'm assuming that each issue is going to be focused on a different room. This one's focused on, on issue, uh, on room number one, I should say, since it's issue number one. Um, it's about this woman who shows up to this hotel. She's escaping an abusive husband. 
Um, she's pregnant. She goes to this hotel to try to stay there for a little bit and she gets sucked in. She cannot leave and things go crazy. Not just for her, but for her neighbors as well. And I'm sure that that stuff's going to unfold in the next few issues. So it feels like it's kind of like Sync in the way that it's going to be a horror anthology that's all tied together in one space. So that seems really cool. Really did like this one. If you really like those horror uh, books and if you like stuff like Sync and Mountainhead, John Lee's other work, definitely check that one out. It was really cool. Red Border is one that takes place um, on the Mexican side of the Mexico-U.S. border and there's a drug cartel and they take out these people that are like informants or like they're witnesses to some kind of crime or a murder or something like that. And they take them all out and you got a couple that survives and they're trying to cross the border into America um, to try to get away from this drug cartel. So that's what this one's about. It's a little bit more crime oriented. So I like how each one of these is definitely steeped in its own genre and it stands its ground there. You got Resistance, which is, you know, like a sci-fi pandemic superhero -y type thing. Hotels, straight up horror. This is a little bit more crime oriented, focused down in on the border. This one was okay out of all the ones from AWA today. I thought this was probably the weaker one. Art's pretty solid. The story's pretty decent, if not a little bit cliche at time. But then Archangel 8. Now we were talking about this last night on my Advanced Review live stream. Um, Michael Morisi's got a bunch of books out. First one I want to talk about is Archangel 8. I really like this one. I did read it again today before I did the video and it blew me away even more on the second one. This is kind of like the Punisher if the Punisher was an Archangel, right? This is a big love letter to Punisher by Michael Morisi. The artwork by C.P. Smith is absolutely fantastic. It's gritty and it's raw and it's exactly what it should be. The basic premise of this is that there are seven known Archangels, but there's an eighth one. He's kind of like a, like a, like a Delta Force assassin type dude or something like that, right? And he gets sent after a person that doesn't, he doesn't seem like there should be anything, you know, there should no not be a reason for him to have to kill this dude, but it's really cool. The book comes across as not super clear about what's actually going on, but once you know what's going on, you can piece it all together and it works very well. And I really like the narration that Michael Maurice is writing in this one. Really solid debut, Archangel number eight. AWA so far? Pretty solid debut. For Impact Theory, we have Hexagon number one. This is another one we talked about on the live stream on Monday night. This one's written by Michael Morisi. It's got a whole bunch of artists and colorists. It's from Impact Theory. This is basically The Last Starfighter. I mean, it is exactly The Last Starfighter. It's set like in the 80s. There's a video game. This kid beats it. And then all of a sudden, this like Space Empire comes. They're like, oh, we need you. You're, you beat it. That's crazy. It was a test all along, right? It's straight up The Last Starfighter. But it's such a great tribute. And it also feels fresh and modern and unique. And it has its own voice and distinctive style all in of itself. I talked a lot about this one and the Archangel 8 book last night on that live stream. Catch it on the replay if you want, but that's a cool one. Um, so if you see these, give them a shot. Pick them up. Lots of great stuff out this week. Undiscovered Country. Let's go over to Image Comics. I like it sometimes when we start on the smaller publishers, right? Undiscovered Country number five is here. This one starts kind of making the story yet again a little bit more clear and providing more questions to be asked. That's what's happened with each issue of Undiscovered Country. But I do feel like any kind of pacing issues I've had with this book have kind of ironed themselves out as the issues have progressed. So I'm still liking it. I'm still down for it. There's a lot of interesting things that are going on here in an America that's been shut off from the rest of the world for decades. The way that they've kind of come up with uh, new legends and mythology and lore and, and ideas and it's like a fantasy post-apocalyptic type thing and it's really cool and I really do like it. And as the, each issue progresses, I'm digging it more and more. I love the artwork. Um, I love the writing. I like the slow uh, build up on the characters and the revelations about them. Really liked it. Undiscovered Country number five out this week from Jeff Lemire. We have The Cinder number 10. First of all, Dustin Wentz artwork just pff, amazing. It's always gorgeous to see this beautiful like watercolor artwork. A Cinder is the spiritual successor of Descender. Descender was a sci-fi epic. <clears throat> this one is a little bit more fantasy epic and it's working really well. You got some tragic moments yet again in this issue. You got um, some deep character moments. You got some shocking moments in the story, some turns in the story. This is the end of the second arc and it really ends in a a way that Descender fans are going to be very happy about. Ascender number 10 is out this week, continues to please. Family Tree, another Jeff Lemire book from Image Comics out this week. Issue number five, this is the end of the first arc of Family Tree. This has been a great book, and what it is is it's about this girl who starts turning into a tree, and her mom's freaking out. Her brother's there. They're trying to figure out what's going on. People are coming after her, trying to kill her, trying to stop her. She just turned into a tree, by the way. So this is the end of the first arc, and it ends suddenly. 
abruptly and then spins off into a completely different direction that I had no idea would be coming. Family Tree number five did something really cool and it took a simple idea and it turned it on its head and has me very excited for arc two. The artwork by Phil Hester is angled and it's a great style to go along with this story. So Family Tree number five is out this week. Middle West number 16. Yes, number 16 is out this week written by Scotty Young with Jorge Corona on the artwork. I'm loving this book. This has been a great book. This is an interesting story arc. In this one, our, our protagonist is a name. I think his name's Abel, if I remember correctly. He's been captured and he's forced to work on this farm where they're they got their like energy stuff that they're growing or whatever. And he's he, in this issue, he he gets together a jailbreak, right? So it's a little bit like the great escape in a way. Um, really great moments, great artwork, some of the best work that Scotty Young has ever done. Um, because it's a great, fun, light fantasy type tale that's very relatable and engaging, but it also keeps delivering. And the artwork is absolutely fantastic and it's got a lot of heart to it as well. Middle West number 16 continues to be a great book. From also from Image Comics, we have Bitterroot number seven. A lot of explaining in this one, some twists and turns. There was a lot of stuff going on in different places in America and at different times, and it kind of was a little hard to follow actually at times. So definitely need to sit down. I want to reread all of this again and try to get my bearings straight, you know, as LA Beast would say. But Bitterroot number seven is a great story about a family of demon hunters in Harlem in the 20s, and I've been loving it. I'm loving these characters, and it's getting pretty effed up in the world of Bitterroot. Issue number seven was pretty cool, if not just a bit confusing with how it was jumping from scene to scene. X-Ray Robot is a new one from Mike Allred and Laura Allred and Company over from Dark Horse Comics. If you like Mike Allred's work, you're gonna love this book. I read it like a month and a half ago and I thought, oh, that was all right. It was weird and it was quirky. Well, that's exactly what you expect out of Mike Allred. A huge fan of his Madman work, uh, the Atomics, all that kind of stuff. But when I reread it today, it really kind of ironed itself out. And that's how it works with Mike Allred. His stuff is so wacky and off the wall sometimes that it's, it's easier to get back into it the second time. I loved it. Thought it was great. It's basically about this dude who's trying to explore if there are other dimensions. He builds a robot. He can control the robot mentally. Um, they send the robot through other dimensions and then things go wild and crazy and it gets kooky and... It's cool. If you like that crazy, cool, Kirby, psychedelic cosmicness, you're going to love it. If you love Mike Allred, you're going to absolutely love this book. It's it's wacky, it's kooky, it's crazy, and it's so much fun and a very clean, poppy, retro style. Really like that. Also from Dark Horse, we have Starship Down, number one. This is a pretty cool by-the-numbers sci-fi book. It's about... Uh, there's like a dig or something like that and they find a spaceship buried in the earth and there's a bunch of crazy like cave paintings and, and artifacts and all kinds of stuff. So it's really cool and it scratches an itch that I really like to see in my stories. It's got artwork by Andrea Muti who was the artist on Fearscape over from Vault Comics. So that's really cool. The artwork is a little bit more typical in here than it is in Fearscape. Of course, the style needs to be a little bit more appropriate, I guess, for this story. But the story was engaging. Like I said, maybe a little bit by the numbers, but I'm a huge Michael Crichton fan and it starts off exactly like a Michael Crichton book. In fact, I was reading this and I was always like getting vibes from like Sphere and Andromeda Strain and I don't know, I kind of like that stuff. Starship Down, number one, an interesting one from Dark Horse Comics. Also, the second issue of Bang is out this week from Dark Horse Comics. This is kind of a Matt Kent's uh, like alternative take on James Bond. The first issue was really, really cool and engaging. The second issue was awesome. Kind of puts the spotlight on a different character, on a different approach to the James Bond mythology, um, but some really cool ideas, some, a really fun approach to this book, and I'm having a lot of fun. If you're a James Bond fan, if you like fun action comics with nice, fun little twists to them, definitely check out Bang. The first issue kind of took off a little bit. Second issue's out this week. I think there's a TV show coming out soon, or, or at least, you know, maybe, possibly one day. But anyway, bang number two, even better than the first one in my opinion. From Vault Comics, we have Wasted Space number 15. This is the end of the third arc of Wasted Space. We talked about this on the stream on Monday night when I did my advanced reviews. Michael Morisi nails the ending on the third arc of Wasted Space. The characters are now set for the next arc and it's going to go into a different direction. There's a lot of explanations and revelations in this issue and some interesting fun stuff. Hayden Sherman, Jason Wordy, Jim Campbell continue to be that support team. All together they just make one of my absolute favorite books out there on shelves and it has been for like two to three years now wasted space continues to enthrall me wasted space number 15 out this week also we got black stars above issue number five this is the final issue of the lonnie nadler jenna chaw brad simpson hassan otsman el how book um 
a really creepy and unnerving ending. It was a little difficult to get through. There was some choices with the dialogue that kind of made it a little clunky and held it back just a little bit. But overall, Black Stars Above was a treat and Lovecraftian cosmological horror. Um really does a great job of leading you into the mindscape of the character, the main character herself. Um, really interesting, creepy stuff and a very appropriate ending that I really did dig. And I'm really excited now that all five issues are out to sit down and read all five in one sitting because I bet that's going to be a pleasure and a treat. Vagrant Queen, A Planet Called Doom, number three from Mags Visaggio, Jason Smith, Harry Saxon, Zach Sam, and Vault Comics. Vault, uh, Vault, Vault Queen, Vag uh, Vagrant Queen, Vagrant. Um, Vagrant Queen has a TV show at the end of the month, so that's coming out on Sci-Fi Channel, so be checking that one out. But this continues on a very fun, decent arc that's really explaining a lot about the main characters and where they're coming from and putting them in another fun adventure. Um, interesting stuff. Vagrant Queen number three. If you like the first series, no reason you're not going to like this one. And Heist, or How to Steal a Planet number five. I could only make it like two-thirds of the way through this book because this has probably been one of the hardest books from Vault that I've ever read, like, to follow. I'm just not that interested in it. Um, so I don't know. I may need to sit down. I've, I've been planning on doing this already, but I think I need to sit down and just read it because I've gotten completely lost. I don't remember who any of the characters are. I don't remember the story. I mean, the world or anything like that. So I need, I need to sit back down and just rethink this one. Um, but Heist, How to, or How to Steal a Planet, number five, is out this week from Vault. I thought that would be the final issue, but it's in fact not. Over the Ropes, issue number four, is here the penultimate issue of Jay Sandlin's series from Mad Cave Studios. It's set in the world of 90s wrestling at the turn when everything right before it goes mainstream. It's great. It's a book about hope. It's a, dream, uh, it's a book about dreams. It's really fun, vibrant stuff, and I think they've been doing a great job. You got lots of cool turns in this one, um, and I really like the setup for the final issue coming out next month. From Oni Press, we have Backtrack issue number two. Um, I really liked issue number one, and I thought issue number two was just as solid. It keeps that momentum going. This book is about a bunch of, I don't know, like there's criminals and there's outcasts and all these different people, and they get captured by this dude who's from the future, and he puts them all in this race against their will. He puts them all in this race through time, right? So like in the first issue, they're 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 like they're like driving and racing and dinosaurs are appearing, right? And then in this one they're like back in like medieval times or something like that. And like people are shooting like bows and arrows and spears and swords at them and stuff like that. Really fun, cool stuff. I really like it. The artwork is very dynamic and it has that that fluid sense of motion that's needed to have a high octane energy book like this. It works so well. It's kind of like wacky races through time but with a little, a little, a lot more bloody, I should say, for real. Some great independent comics out this week. And now from Marvel Comics, we have Spider-Woman number one out this week. I got the cool Chip Kid die cut cover. You know I'm a sucker for a good die cut cover. This is not near as cool as the Spider-Man one that he did, or especially the Wolverine one, that one was fire, but this is still kind of cool, still kind of cool. So yet, you know, a new Spider-Woman book, Um, it was okay. I've never really liked a Spider-Woman book, to be honest with you, like, I just never really liked a lot of Spider-Woman books. Um, it's okay. She's an interesting character, but I don't know. She gets a new costume. There's an interesting thing going on there. I don't know. This just didn't do much for me. I don't think if you've ever really gotten into a Spider-Woman book before, you're. I don't think this one's really going to do anything extra for you. Um, it's okay. But it's just never a character that's really appealed to me that much, but I do love that die-cut cover. This book's got a crap ton of covers, by the way. But Spider-Woman number one was, it was okay. But it wasn't anything super memorable or anything kind of game-changing for me. Except for, I guess, she gets a new costume and I guess that's cool. Outlawed number one is here. So this is a one-shot, I believe, that kicks off this whole new vibe for Champions and some other books. Like, it brings back New Warriors, which is very exciting. This is basically like... You remember the Superhero Registration Act? It's kind of like that, but it's like... What's happening now is the government wants to ban superheroes under the age of 21. And it kind of makes sense. And then, of course, you have an inciting, uh, an inciting event here. It gets explained. Um, it's champion centric. So if you've been following the uh, the champions book and you're liking it, check it out here. This is written by Al Ewing, but this was actually a, a good book. Even if you haven't been keeping up with champions, which I haven't, you can jump right in here and check it out. These are great characters. It's an interesting event. It does feel a little bit like the teen version of Civil War, but obviously a little bit different. But it was okay and it wasn't bad. And I thought it was actually the start of something really nifty. And now I'm even more excited about that new Warriors book, which is going to be tied into all this, plus Power Pack and the relaunching 
champion. So if you're into that stuff, definitely check out Outlawed. It's pretty much going to be essential. X-Force is out with issue number nine this week. This has been one of my favorite X-Men books and it continues to be. So Joshua Kassara, his artwork is so amazing. This book is really cool because first of all, you get to see X-Force and the rest of the mutants kind of kick back and party down. Um, Wolverine and Dakin have a very interesting form of, uh, of, of father-son bonding uh, and very interesting way, I guess you should say, instead of playing catch, whatever they do here. Some interesting developments about Domino post-resurrection. You got Beast being shady, Black Tom being crazy. Real fun stuff. Great textured artwork. Benjamin Percy's been killing it on this book and I'm liking it. And in this one, they get set up to go to this this like like Central American or South American country. It's like they got like old like Olmec and Mayan type stuff there and there's like plants and evil stuff. It's crazy and it's fun. And if you've been liking X-Force, no reason why you're not. And if you haven't been reading X-Force, this is one of the best X-Men books out there right now. For real. And it's so much fun. Some great stuff in the pages of issue number nine. Excalibur number nine is here as well. Eh. I'm really starting to lose it on Excalibur. Excalibur. You know, I think if you're an old school Excalibur fan, they're starting to get to some stuff that maybe feel more familiar to you. You know, obviously they have the Warwolf stuff that they each did, and now they got the Saturn 9 type stuff going on. So that's interesting. I never really got that much into Excalibur except for during the Warren Ellis days. So to me, it's like, okay, but I'm more interested in here to see what's going on with Apocalypse because it's where Apocalypse is. So I'm just going to keep reading it because of that. Also, man, Shogo. Tell me it ain't true. What? No spoilers. Just kidding. Guardians of the Galaxy issue number three is here. I've completely lost... It's completely lost me with this one. They just fake killed Star-Lord again last issue. Um, now they're dealing with that. And then they're trying to set up the... I just... I'm not liking it. It's Al Ewing. I was hopeful. I thought it'd be cool. First issue and the second issue kind of got me a little bit more interested. Third issue, lost my interest. It does have a cool... The way that they approach the story in the beginning, it's interesting... But we know what's meaningless. Star-Lord's not dead. Come on. Come on. But I'm not interested at all in Guardians of the Galaxy, so that's probably going to be the last one I read. Fantastic Four number 20 is here, so it's a great epilogue to the point of origin story and in a great, fun, Wyatt Wingfoot, Johnny Storm team-up. Because you always got to have those every so often in the Fantastic Four. Wyatt Wingfoot, they need help. The Mole Man's coming around. Um, Johnny shows up there with his new soulmate Sky, so he gets to introduce his soulmate to his best friend, so it's fun. It's got a nice vibrant feel to it. It feels connected from the previous adventure and setting up into the next adventure. Feels like a Fantastic Four book. I think the point of origin story went on a bit too long, but this was great. It's a nice one and done story, even though the whole first half is pretty much an epilogue to the point of origin story. It felt like a classic Fantastic Four book, and that gave me lots of excitement. Captain Marvel number 16 is here, or actually 150. Um, this book is okay. This wraps up the, the last Avengers story. And I was really down for what Kelly Thompson was doing with his character, but it's just kind of started losing me. The stories themselves don't don't interest me as much. Like once they're done, I'm kind of like, ah, yeah, big deal, whatever. So I don't know. This may, I may be dipping out of Captain Marvel for a minute, maybe picking up the trades or something like that one. But I wanted to stick it through with this last Avenger story, which started off so strong with so much promise and just kind of petered out for me. Definitely petered out towards the end here. Issue number 16, it's all right. And if you want to celebrate a 150, I need something bigger. I need something more monumentous to happen, if that makes sense. Iron Age 2020, continuing all this unnecessary tie to the Iron Man 2020 event. You know, the Iron Man 2020 story is not bad to read. It's a great Iron Man story. It's fun. It's a fun Iron Man story. All these tie-ins are kind of worthless and meaningless, though it's nice to see, you know, Force Works come back for a little bit. Iron Age 2020 has got like three different stories in it. Um, none of them are significant to the event. None of them are important. So there you go. And then we got Machine Man 2020 issue number two. That was the final issue of this two issue series. And once again, nothing super important. Didn't really do anything for me. I'm just not liking... Machine Man during this whole 2020 event, so I don't know. It's a little cheesy, a little dumb. That's kind of what I think about the whole thing, but the main series is still just okay. Marvel's X number three is here. This continues to be a great book. Really fun stuff. This is a bridge between the Marvel Universe as we know and love it and Earth X. When it's a world, it's like post-apocalyptic, a dystopian future, the Marvel Universe, everybody's turned into a mutant, um, all hope seems lost, and all that kind of stuff. How do we get there? And that's the story that Marvel's X is telling, and it's telling it very well. And there's a nice uh, amount of respect for the Marvel Universe. Of course, it's Alex Ross, 
Jim Kruger and Welby. Welby's artwork's really good and does a great job of kind of capturing that feel from Earth X and Universe X and Paradise X and all that stuff. So if you like all those books, you're, you're going to like this one. It's really cool. It focuses on the one kid who has not been infected, the last surviving human. You got Spider Man, you got Daredevil, and this one you got a little bit about the Fantastic Four, and you got a Doctor Strange appearance that's really, really cool. So I've been liking this book, and I'm going to stick with it. Morbius number five is here. This kind of ends the first arc on Morbius. May dip out of this one, too. Um, the story's still cool, and I like some of the thematic approach that Vita Ayala is taking and approaching with the story. I like the direction that they're taking Morbius into. Obviously, he's got a movie coming out. Morbius is becoming more monstrous. He's got, like, bat wings and crap now. Um, so that's really cool and interesting, but the artwork is just getting a little sloppy. It felt very rushed in issue number five. So maybe I'll check out issue number six if it comes out on a lighter week but if it's on a big heavy week like this again Morbius is going to be a skipper and a trade waiter for me because I think it'll read better as one big trade but what I have been impressed with this with what I have been impressed with with this series is the the visceral grotesque and violent nature of it and it really leans heavy into its 70s marble horror roots and I do like that so Morbius number five is out this week Star Wars number four is here continuing the story that picks up at the end of Empire Strikes Back I was about to dip out of this because I usually just trade weight most of the Star Wars books except for Vader that one usually keeps me engaged um, but this one new one hasn't been as solid but we'll see what happens but Star Wars number four I read because someone on the live stream Sunday night told me that this was going to explain how Luke finds and gets his green lightsaber that's not the case. So if you read that somewhere, it's not true. However, it does deal with the idea that he needs a new lightsaber. And it's a cool book, and it's fun. And Charles Soule's doing a great job with it. But definitely something I'm going to start trade waiting because I can't keep having 47 comic book weeks. Whew. I mean, I guess I could. I mean, who doesn't want to sit down and read 47 comics in a day? Let's go over to DC. We got the Robin 80th Anniversary Super Spectacular Special. It's like a uh, hundred pages. It's ten bucks. There's gonna be a bunch of covers. The decade covers. We know what's going on now. They've done this with Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash, now Robin, come upcoming Joker and Catwoman. Um, I got that Tim Drake cover by Jim Chung, the '90s cover, because I'm a Tim Drake fan. Um, this is a nice celebration of all things Robin. It, it really accurately gives you a representation of every Robin in almost every form, except for we don't really get a Carrie Kelly story, but we do get some art in there with Carrie Kelly. So that's kind of cool. And of course, she's on the 80s cover with the Frank Miller cover. But I opted for that 90s because it's Tim Drake. But you got a Dick Grayson story when he's Robin. You got a Dick Grayson story when he's Nightwing. You got a Dick Grayson story when he's Grayson, you know, when he was a secret agent for Spiral or whatever. You got a Dick Grayson story when he's leading the Titans. You got a Robin story with Tim Drake. You got a Robin story when he's with his Titans. You know, it's things like that, right? So it, it works up and it really captures the whole vibe and feel. It's a nice celebration of Robin. No one particular story really stands out super strong. Well, maybe the James Tiny and Tim Drake story. I really like that one because it, it kind of works as a little bit of a prelude to his Detective Comics run. So that was a nice little touch. Anyway, I love Robin. I've always loved Robin. My name's Robin. So of course I'm going to pick that one up. Um, Deceased, Unkillables, issue number two. This is a great Full Metal Jacket homage cover there. Super, super cool. Second issue was great. Bonkers, wild, super cool. I realized that the artist of this book is the guy who does The Man Who Effed Up Time. Didn't even realize it until I was reading this. So that was cool. Added a new dimension to it. I liked it. I thought this was better than issue number one, and I did like issue number one. Basically, the premise is this takes place during and a little bit after the previous deceased book, um, and a bunch of villains have banned together. Um... Because they're like, well, it's killed all the heroes, so we're going to be able to outlive this and take over the world. Real fun stuff. You got Savage in here. You got Lady Shiva in here. You got Cassandra Kane. You got Red Hood. You got Deathstroke. Really cool book. I'm really liking it. Some great stuff here. It's basically just zombies in the DC Universe. But Tom Taylor's able to actually make it emotional, to make it impactful, and like he did with Injustice, make something that doesn't really mean anything as far as continuity goes, make it feel like it means everything. This book was awesome, and that cover is awesome. The Matina is like a cheetah cover. That was tough. You're the villain, Hell Arisen, number four is here. It's the final issue of Hell Arisen. No punchline, by the way. So don't get hyped up on that. Um, but a great, great ending for this. This is the bridge between Scott Snyder's Justice League run um, and Death Metal. And it's a perfect bridge. The way it ends, you got Luther versus the Batman who laughs with Perpetua in the middle. It all sets up Death Metal. It's got a great ending. Steve Epting's artwork was absolutely fantastic. James Tynion, he's been um, Snyder's co-architect in all of this this whole time. He has just expertly set up death metal and I cannot wait to see what's about to happen but here it is the final battle between Luther and the Batman who laughs but you know what it ain't the final battle it ain't the final battle 
Batman number 91 is out. James Tynion just keeps getting better and better each single issue. This one, great. You got different artwork by different people. You got Jorge Jimenez. You got Rafael Albuquerque. You've got Carlos uh, uh, Paculion. Um, but they're all kind of focused in on their own scenes. Like the opening scenes are the only one done by Jorge Jimenez. And it's got the Joker. And once again, he just draws a hellaciously scary and awesome Joker. Absolutely loved it. Batman number 91, a great issue. The designer's back. We're finding out more about him, what exactly his plans have entailed, and now we're just to this frantic rush. Plus, you get all this Joker stuff that's building up, and it's building up so crazy. Speaking of Joker stuff, so the journey to the Joker's War starts in Nightwing number 70. This book has gone crazy online. It has no punchline in it. There's literally no reason for it to be this crazy. I think it's a mistake on some people's part. Um, however, Journey to Joker War does start here. They're still picking up the pieces. Can you remember, you know, Dick Grayson got shot in the head. He forgot who he was. Apparently it was all like the Court of Owls doing it to him or something like that. And now he like can't quite remember if he's Dick or if he's Rick or whatever. I don't know. It's picking up from like what's been going on in Nightwing and I haven't been reading it. But there are some Joker stuff and the Joker starts slowly setting up what he's going to do. I guess, you know, Joker, the Joker War's coming and he's just going after everybody. But anyway, Nightwing number 70, it's probably going to be really hard to find. People are going to be trying to charge a lot of money for this. Um, don't pay more in cover for this because I don't think it's worth it. That's just me though. If you want to, do what you will. Justice League number 43 is here. I was probably about to stop this, then I realized this is the final issue of this Eradicator arc, so let me read this, and yeah, it's okay. But it's just a throwaway Justice League story. It's a throwaway Justice League run. After the big epicness, that was the Scott Snyder run, and how it all set up this big cosmic stuff coming in death metal, this feels kind of silly and just not epic enough. It doesn't have enough high enough stakes, and you know that everything's going to be okay because you don't even know where it places, and I don't know. It's okay. It's okay. Justice League 43. Man, I don't like it when I don't like a Justice League comic book. Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen number nine is here. This is such a great book. If you have not been reading Jimmy Olsen, this book is amazing. This issue, nine, so there's three left. Yeah, three left after this one. I had to count on my fingers. Um, Matt Fraction and company, uh, Steve Lieber. Man, an amazing job. This if I would never have thought that one of my favorite comic books of the last year would have been a Jimmy Olsen comic book, but Matt Fraction and company are doing such a great job. Big turning points in this. Um, Jimmy gets a clue, and so does the audience. We start kind of piecing it together. The structure of the story, the way the story's told, it's told through all these different vignettes, some in completely different styles. It makes fun of the absurdity of the character of Jimmy Olsen and the absurdity of the history of Jimmy Olsen, and it wraps it up in a nice, fun, absurd bow and a really delicate and intricately structured book. Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, number nine, out this week. Aquaman, number 58. So now we got Aqua Baby. We skip ahead 10 months. Man, we skipped ahead a lot, right? Anyway, Mira's like in a coma now. So Atlantis is in turmoil. Aquaman is raising Aqua Baby on the land and can't come and take over Atlantis. And then you've got Ocean Master down in the water trying to stir shit up again, trying to take the throne. Sounds like an Aquaman comic book. It was fun. It had great artwork, um, really solid writing. I've really been liking what Kelly Sudaconic plus Aquaman gets a haircut. And I think it's uh, for the better to be honest. Also, we got a Brave and the Bold 28 facsimile edition. This is the first appearance of the Justice League of America. This is the best Justice League comic book you're going to get this week. Um, this is real fun stuff. If you've never read it, it's silly, it's great, but it's also the first appearance of Starro the Conqueror. Definitely worth checking out. And do remember that originally Superman and Batman were not founding members of the Justice League. But Aquaman was. The 100-page Titans Giant is out this week with a new story um, and some old-school stories. So that's cool. If you're a Titans fan, definitely check that out. And finally, from DC Black Label, we got some Hill House books. Lolo Woods, issue number four, took another turn, got stranger, got more absurd, got deeper, got more enriched, got more compelling, got more engaging. This is fire and really is coming up on Dollhouse Family to being one of my favorite Hill House comic books so far. Lolo Woods has been an interesting journey. It was unclear at first, it got wild, then it got unclear and even more wild, and now it's getting even more wild, but a little bit more clear. Lolo Woods number four was such a joy. Creepy, effective, unnerving, horror 
Great stuff right there. Also from Hill House by Joe Hill himself, Stuart Amonin and Dave Stewart, we have Plunge. Plunge number two. This book starts delving into some very Lovecraftian type areas in issue number two. This one also is reminiscent of a Michael Crichton novel, the way it starts off and the way it's set up. It's really cool and I'm really liking it. Issue two I thought was better than issue number one. Um, and now it's got me wanting to go back and reread issue number one and then go back into issue number two. Plunge number two was really cool and Hill House Comics is just standing out. They're great horror on shelves right now. So that's what I read. 47 books. What are you reading? What are you excited for? These are trying times. We all got to get through it together. If you can, buy some comics and read them and just escape for a little bit and then get back to, to dealing with the craziness of the real world after visiting the craziness of comic books. Anyway, what are you excited about reading? Let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching the video. Please do like, share, and subscribe and join us over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts and a whole lot more. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading and stay safe.